right, everyone, welcome to Book Court. Thank you so much for being here. We're here tonight with uh, Tony Fletcher, uh, the author of uh, the Light, A Light That Never Goes Out, The Enduring Saga of the Smiths. Uh, Tony's the author of six books, including Moon, the best-selling biography of Keith Moon, and Remarks Made, the definitive biography of R.E.M. He's contributed to many publications and television shows on both sides of the Atlantic, including Newsday, Spin, Mojo, Behind the Music, and more. And he lives in New York's Catskill Mountains. Um, he's going to read to us a little bit, and we're going to have a little discussion, and then he'll take questions from the audience. Um, he will be in discussion with Rob Sheffield, and I want to say a couple things about Rob. He's been a music journalist for more than 20 years. He's a columnist for Rolling Stone, where he writes about music, TV, and pop culture. Uh, he regularly appears on VH1. He's the author of the national bestseller, Love is a Mixtape, Life and Loss, One Song at a Time, which has been translated into French, German, Swedish, Italian, Japanese, Russian, and other languages he can't read. He lives with his wife here uh, in Brooklyn. We have both of his books here, Talking to Girls About Duran Duran and Love is a Mixtape, if anyone would like one. Um, uh, so uh, I guess without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Tony. Please welcome Tony Fletcher. Thanks very much. How's everybody doing? This is uh, the first event for this book in this country, at least. I just uh, came back from doing a couple of events in the UK, uh, one in London and one in Manchester, and the book came out here on Tuesday, and we we're really happy to do the first event here in Book Court in Brooklyn. I uh, spent nine years living in Brooklyn over on the Warren Street, not far from here at all. I know this store very well, and uh, we have another event on Monday the 17th at Strand Books, which is going to be hosted by Matt Pinfield, who's a good friend of mine, and uh, kind of the reason that I'm married uh, to, the, to the wife that I'm still married with, uh, or married to, I should say. And so the, so the format we figured is, I'm going to, I, I figured it might be fun to just read a little bit from the book, about 10, 15 minutes worth, and then Rob's going to come up here, and we're just going to have a, like a back and forth chat, and then we'll make sure we have time for, for, for Q&A, <coughs> to throw it out for Q&A. And uh, I feel like just before I get started, it would uh, kind of just be, be nice for me to acknowledge, but I'm, I'm really fortunate tonight, both my UK and my my US editors are here, and uh, so Suzanne and Jason, it's really nice to have you both in the room. Thanks so much for the support and seeing this book through. It's a thrill to have this out. It's, it, it means a lot. And also to Mike Harriet, who, uh, my agent who initiated the whole project, and, and likewise, can, you know, thank you for doing your part to seeing this through to, uh, to fruition. It's a long book, so I'm not going to read too much from it. The, um, if you haven't seen it, if you don't know too much about the Smiths, I would certainly say start at the beginning. The introduction really helps set the scene. That introduction is available online at various, uh, the, the publisher's various websites. So I thought rather than read from the introduction, which uh, would sort of tell you how Morrissey met Marr, and that's an interesting story, I thought I would jump into uh, The Smiths in America. And um, uh, just, yeah, just jump into that. A uh, big part for me about writing this book was the, the stuff that has been written about the Smiths, even though I'm British, even though I was around uh, basically in the UK uh, during, during, while the Smiths were together. I just feel like so much that's been written about the Smiths has been written from a sort of what I call a little a parochial perspective, very, very British, as though this is a British band that did not exist beyond the, uh, the borders of the United Kingdom. And I think everybody in this room would know that that's not the case. And I really wanted, when I wrote this book, to, to it's great to start in Manchester, that's extremely important but then to take a worldwide view and uh, really make it clear that this was a band that translated and so this chapter is uh, set in um, 85 uh, which is when Smiths first came to America. I'm sorry I've got a bit of the sniffles. You cannot do two weeks in England uh, going around the country as much as I did without getting the sniffles. I'm amazed I don't have a full-blown cold so excuse me if I sniff now and then. Okay here we go. This is from chapter 28. America had been waiting for the Smiths not just in the literal sense, in that there were some people who had latched onto Hand in Glove when it came out in 1983 and had spent the subsequent 24 months eagerly anticipating the announcement of an American tour. But in a less tangible manner, a certain stateside audience had long been looking for a band like the Smiths to come on the scene and to use the sense of religious fervor that was often applied around the cult of Morrissey to save them. The Anglophile music tastes of a significant percentage of young Americans were part of a cultural continuum that had begun with the Beatles and the original British invasion and had continued on through years of hard rock, 
to the point that the introduction to punk rock and new wave came for many, not through native acts such as the Ramones and Richard Hell, but the likes of The Clash and Elvis Costello. Indeed, in large parts of the states, the thriving American punk independent scene was all but ignored for the constant flurry of new musical activity from the UK. This was a bone of significant contention for those American acts who traversed the country on a shoestring budget through the early 1980s, opening up and then servicing an entire new network of venues, fanzines, radio outlets and record stores. But then most of those, these acts were non-commercial by design, the tag of hardcore adopted by many as an antidote to the era's perceived domination by Reaganites and yuppies. Those American youth who considered themselves outside of the mainstream but nonetheless wanted some melody in their new music and some, some flamboyance from their preferably overseas idols served as the ideal initial audience for MTV, which launched in 1981 and soon made stars out of image-conscious British acts like Culture Club, The Rhythmics, Adam and the Ants, Duran Duran, A Flock of Seagulls and so many more. Away from this mainstream so-called second British invasion, young Americans with somewhat more esoteric tastes were best able to hear new independent British music, either via the multitude of non-commercial college radio stations or the growing number of commercial, progressive and new music stations. The arrival of this new radio format proved sufficiently organic that it lacked for an official name. The term modern rock was not even recognised as worthy of a distinct billboard chart until 1988, after the Smiths broke up. A K-Rock in Los Angeles, which officially abandoned its stalwarts like the Rolling Stones and Pink Floyd for a diet of solid new wave in 1982, they called it the rock of the 80s. On Long Island in New York at WLIR, one of the original East Coast progressive rock stations and one that made a similarly permanent switch that same year, they called it simply new music. As this new music format gathered momentum, it discovered its niche. Melodic British bands, the word postmodern was more likely to be used in the States than post-punk, that had been picked up by American major labels but had not been overly hyped by them and which could cultivate a live reputation away from MTV's image-conscious affiliations. To the extent that one could line up the leading acts musically, U2 stood at one end of this spectrum, Depeche Mode at the other, and The Cure, Echo and the Bunnymen and New Order filled some of the more prominent positions in between. When the Smiths came along, it was, if, it was as if they had been tailor-made to appeal right across this spectrum. As a four-piece guitar band that eschewed the use of synthesizers, they were instantly credible with U2 and Bunnymen fans. As an act that proved immediately popular on the alternative American dance floor, they appealed to New Order and Depeche Mode acolytes. And as a band whose lyrics spoke vividly about suburban alienation, sexual confusion, teenage angst, economic inopportunity, domestic violence, educational disappointments, and personal dysfunctionality, it turned out that geographical origins be damned, they connected with an entire generation of American adolescents for whom such subject matter was universal. And this is a quote from Colin Malloy of the Decemberists. The stories of provincial England resonated somehow, impossibly, with my agonized adolescence in provincial Montana, with all its hicks and jocks and repressed meddling adults. Uh, for him, the carnival ideal of Russia and ruffians could be the last chance stampede and fair with all its wheeling rides, desperate teens and drunken toughs. The brute in the song The Headmaster Ritual was my moustache short shorted gym teacher, Mr. Trenery. Throw in the fact that the Smiths initially put off touring America, that their second album, Hatful of Hollow, was available only as an import, that second's in, in uh, quote marks for anybody who's going to challenge that, was available only as an import, as were so many of their additional singles, and that they had not even been seen on the fringes of MTV, having made no videos, because the Smiths didn't believe in making videos, there was an almost mystical element of intrigue about the Smiths. Indeed, their music was frequently exchanged among fans on home-copied cassette tapes, while videotape bootlegs of their old grey whistle test performance from Derby in late 1983 could be found on sale at import record stores on St. Mark's Place in New York City. As a result of all this, when it came time to tour the States, it became apparent that the Smiths could afford to bypass the clubs and appear directly in American theatres. The Smiths' sudden entry into the big leagues became evident when the, their agent, Ian Copeland, received the group's stage requirements and concluded that they would seem to describe a ping-pong table compared to the stages on this tour. But he didn't take into account the Smiths' fixed sense of proportion. Says John Featherstone, the group's lighting designer, the band always wanted to maintain that sense of being in proximity to each other. There was a relatively compressed sweet spot where everyone wanted to be. We never had a wider stage opening than 40 feet. 
As the tour grew closer, though, the lack of an authoritative management figure became a much greater issue of concern. And one of the commonalities, one of the common threads of the Smith story is that they couldn't find or couldn't trust or couldn't keep a manager long enough to kind of keep themselves out of, out of chaos. So Scott Peering, who was their sort of de facto manager at the time, who, who basically got paid by Rough Trade but looked after the Smiths, Scott Peering, who was an American, had experience of touring the States dating back to Bob Marley and Third World. But because he had neither the time nor the capacity to tackle the logistical intricacies for the Smiths, he recommended the group hire a long-term professional acquaintance. The group's crew, having developed a specific stage presence for the Smiths, preferred the more expensive option of renting their own equipment for the entire tour and having it trucked from city to city. Uh, in classic Smiths fashion, days and then weeks passed with no decision. Tickets went on sale, concerts sold out, promoters, agents and de facto management alike began to pull their hair out. The likelihood of the tour going ahead as planned was dealt a further blow when, in early May, Morrissey stood up an interviewer from People, arguably America's most prominent magazine, with readership in the 30 million range. Rough Trade's good-natured and eternally patient press officer, Rough Trade being their record label, of course, Pat Bellis, had brought the journalists up to Manchester for the occasion, only to spend the entire day sitting in the Britannia Hotel while frantic phone calls were made to London and Phil Powell, their roadie, dispatched from Johnny Marr's house to Morrissey's house to try to locate the singer. Naturally, there was no reply. The next day, Bellis, professionally embarrassed, sat down to express her disappointment. Morrissey, she pleaded in writing, all I ask is, is that if you do not want to do an interview or whatever, please, please just say so. Or even if you change your mind at the last minute to telephone someone to let them know what is going on. It is then our job to make the excuses on your behalf, which although that is hardly a pleasant task in itself, is far better than leaving people sitting around waiting for your arrival. I am now more than ever concerned about arranging interviews or press for you as I can never be sure that you will turn up. Nonetheless, the People magazine interview was rescheduled. Morrissey showed up this time, and a two-page spread appeared in the midst of the American tour. The journalist, Fred Hauptfuhrer, turned out to be a major fan, and the piece, other than references to Morrissey's close relationship with his living mother, who thinks all her son needs to make life complete as a good woman, was complimentary in the extreme, with no mention of his maltreatment first time round. <coughs> Pop stars, Hauptfuhrer probably knew from experience, could get away with such behavior. Journalists could not. And then I'm jumping, as you can see, jumping a few pages. This is uh, the, the, the edited version from the 700-page book. And we'll jump into the tour itself. And again, excuse the snivels. The Smiths' relationship with their stateside audience immediately exceeded even their wildest expectations. Although other British groups enjoyed a hysterical welcome in America through the 1980s, Something about these particular four lads extended that much further into a certain American psyche. Fans at the American shows didn't just cheer, clap and holler, they actually screamed. Support act Billy Bragg noticed immediately how there was a kind of Beatlemania going on that I'd never seen before, and that included the American tour he had undertaken with the Bunnymen the previous year. The same with FBI booking agent Steve Ferguson, who at the Beacon Theatre in New York was amazed on so many levels by the intensity of the fans. He called it like watching history in the making, citing this tidal wave of fans invading the stage, just worshipping and hanging on every syllable that Morrissey would sing. They were clearly different than just another English band coming from overseas. It was such a unique situation. I'd never seen people behave like that before. It was boys and girls. This was like going to church for them and Morrissey was the Messiah and people were just losing their shit. Noted Andy Rourke of the Singers Appeal in America, Morrissey's lyrics were universal. They talked about what nobody else in the music industry was expressing at those times. He said what everybody was feeling. The kids in America have to go to college. They're ripped away from their home. Sure, there are lonely people there and people who don't fit. And that was the main thing, that Morrissey's lyrics spoke to those lonely people, those misfits. Going back to Billy Bragg here. Particularly at that time, what he was doing was so different to what everyone else was doing. The only other person I could ever think of who'd done that before was Bowie when he was going through his androgynous phase. And I think some of the responses to the Smiths were about the same sort of level as people responded to Bowie when he first broke. Morrissey's presence somehow allowed you to do things that you wouldn't otherwise be allowed to do. There was something vaguely transgressive about Mozart. To this end, Morrissey's quote in Rolling Stone the previous year, in which he said, I don't know anybody who is absolutely exclusively heterosexual. It limits people's potential in so many areas. 
appear to have had a direct and positive impact on the Smith's potential audience and his own reception. Said Johnny Marr, I was always so proud of our gender politics and our politics with a capital P. And as we got bigger, I became more proud, but none more so than when we went to America, where it really flew in the face of the mainstream. It was weird to call the number one album Meet His Murder in England, but in America in the mid 80s, it was really something. If the Smiths, especially Morrissey, appeared exotic to the American fans, the reaction was no less profound in reverse. John Featherstone, that's the lighting designer, recalled the collective astonishment when they made it to the San Diego open air theater and looked out on the audience. It was like being on Planet Beautiful, he said, of the Southern Californians, whose behavior was similarly alien to a band of working class Mancunian Irish from poor backgrounds. Americans know how to do many things, he said. They don't know how to do dark and northern. <laughs> Watching the way that someone in California tries to be dark and northern, it has an underlying exuberance to it, which doesn't have years of depressed economy and decline as an undercurrent to it. It helped that, artistically, the group was absolutely on fire. Said the group's uh, British agent, Mike Hink, everybody was talking up the Smiths all the time. Nobody was talking them down. But when they got there, they had the goods and they delivered. From his perspective, it was the guitar that cracked it in America. Morrissey is critical to the band in all countries, in all stages, but what opened the door to America was the guitar work. Said Johnny Marr, I felt from the minute I got there in America, it was difficult for me because I assumed they weren't going to understand my approach to the guitar. I felt under such incredible pressure in America. I was being heralded as the biggest thing, but I never played solos, and I didn't play conventional rock guitar. His fears proved unfounded. From the very first American show, he said, it worked out. The Americans loved it. Indeed, the shows were phenomenal, running to an hour and a half, with the Barbarism Begins at Home encore frequently stretched to a 12-minute funk workout as some of the crowd danced alongside the band on stage. Audiences seemed to know every song, from Hand in Glove through the Hatful of Hollow Import Cuts, down to every last word of Meet His Murder. Even the single Shakespeare's Sister, the British single Shakespeare's Sister, elicited screams of recognition, in part because it had been included as a B-side on the 7-inch of How Soon Is Now, the song that, more so than any other, caused immediate frenzy in the mostly seated venues. Given that Morrissey had been such a student of American music in general, the New York scene in particular, his sudden godlike status would have been expected to have had a profound effect on his psyche. But despite the tour running efficiently, there was a lack of experienced counsel in this regard. Said Grant Showbiz, the group's uh, sound engineer, I think Morrissey needed the most looking after, and perversely, I think he felt like he didn't need looking after. That joy at his own company and belief in the way he did things meant that he needed more help taking advice on things like how to relax, how to keep himself healthy, how to express the after show. I sometimes used to think, what is Morrissey doing now as we are shouting loudly in a room with drink and people who want to talk to us and tell us we're wonderful? What is Morrissey doing now? Is it all being internalized? Is he asleep? Is he reading a book? The problem was that nobody really knew. The rest of the Smith's entourage was too busy having fun. Said Andy Rourke, that whole tour was head turning. England is such a small place and people have such a small mentality. So to be thrown into America and have all this adoration. Fame is a strange thing and everyone handles it different. Between us band members, we never talked about it. For me, I launched myself into drugs and drink. I don't know what Morrissey launched himself into. Hot chocolate and Oscar Wilde books. <laughs> we were young kids. I was 21 when I went to America. And there's no handbook for handling fame. No instructions. Said the group's production manager, Mark Gosling. You come out of the 80s in the UK, and you've come up from some council estate in Manchester, and someone wants to send you off business class on some jet to New York, you're going to make the most of it, aren't you? The Brits abroad have always been like that. With quality cocaine and plentiful and inexpensive supply, Gosling found himself roped into a role as the supplier of things that kept everyone going, as he put it. The three playing members and most of the crew were enjoying the rock and roll aspect of touring America. Morrissey was coping with the adulation aspect on his own. The American tour was short by many standards and wisely avoided areas in which ticket sales may have been slower and reactions less hysterical. As it turned out, How Soon Is Now did not cross over into the pop charts and Meet His Murder had peaked on the American album charts just before the group arrived, stalling outside the top 100, though that still recognised a significant achievement for a British band that was coming up through the alternative channels. And over the course of the tour, the relationship with the record company was repaired as well. On the West Coast, uh, President Lenny Waronker 
came down to meet Johnny Marr at Soundcheck and taught production techniques. And Sire boss Seymour Stein demonstrated his allegiance by flying out to LA, jumping about in the front rows at the Palladium, and taking Morrissey out for a high-profile power dinner at the Ivy, where Paul Simon was brought over from an adjacent table to meet Sire's latest star. The tour concluded with that vast crowd of 15,000 at Irvine Meadows <coughs> Amphitheater, or Irvine Meadows Amphitheater, whichever you call it, and a greater stage invasion than usual that led to the longest ever encore of Barbarism Begins at Home, a full 15 minutes. It was the last time the Smiths would play that song. A couple of weeks later, back in Britain, Morrissey tried to put the whole American experience into words for Record Mirror. It was very hysterical, very wild, very passionate, very moving. All those things people never believe. It was really quite stunning, even for me, to see it happen. We went over there, I think, with quite a humble nature, and we didn't expect any fanatical fervor or uncontrollable hysteria. Therefore, when it happened, I was rendered speechless. From his time living in Colorado as an anonymous social inadequate, Morrissey had first-hand experience of the blandest, most crass elements of American pop culture, of the tour, um, pop culture politics and everyday living. Now, from the vantage point of the touring icon, it all looked very different. Meeting the people there was an extraordinary eye-opener, he said, because one is fed all these fixed impressions of the American music by in public, and they didn't turn out to be that way. They turned out to be rational, incredibly sensitive, poetic human beings. So I'm going to leave the reading part there, and uh, Rob Sheffield is going to come up. And uh, I'd like to really, really thank Rob for taking part in this. He and I haven't met, and he... he uh, wrote a lovely blurb for the back cover and then that sort of back scratching uh, uh, habit that we writers do sometimes have I have to say that, that his, uh, his book Love is a Mixtape is a fantastic memoir if you haven't read it it's, it's, it's gut wrenching it's really emotional but it's a great music piece of music history as well so if you already have a copy of my book and you, you want to support local indie stores his books are for sale we're here tonight as well thanks Rob thanks Tony alright need some water you okay thank you so much love water is this one? Uh, yeah, I can. Oh, sorry. Right. Uh, we got first things first. Uh, th thank you for writing such a great book about a great band. I think like a lot of people uh, felt like I've been waiting years for this book. Uh, mm -hmm. It probably feels to you like you've been waiting years for it to be done um, and, and, yes. and complete. Uh, it, it seems like it must have been a long time coming for you. I got an email from Johnny Marr at one point when I was, when I was fact-checking. And he said, you've got to be careful, Tony. You're going to spend more time on this book than I spent on this in Smith. <laughs> and I actually looked back to when I had first approached him about doing this book. And I was like, actually, you're kind of... Right. <laughs> so when you meant that long time, do you mean a long time doing the book or a long time coming? Do you mean a long time doing the book or a long time gestating the idea? Well, you talk a bit about being a Smith fan in the 80s and the yeah. sort of the impact on pop culture that it had then uh, on, on your life, like on, on culture in general. Uh, it, it seems like there's a lot in the book that seems like it must have been that you must have been thinking about since the 80s. I think there's uh, a lot there that I wanted to have come out there. You, you know, I said this at the start of at the start of the evening that that it was very important for me that this book tackled more than just the British scenario. And that's partly why, why I read from that chapter. So there have been books on the Smiths, but they've all only been been written in Britain and published in Britain. And um, I think you know if there was anything kind of going through my head over these years, it it, it was a you know I'm a I'm a I'm an expat, um, I'm a I'm a citizen now. I have dual citizenship, and I I I just felt like there's a lot of social economic stuff that didn't seem to have gotten into other Smiths books that I really wanted to get across, which is why the first chapter is sort of six thousand words about Manchester prior to any of the Smiths' parents getting there, because I think you need to understand Manchester to understand what where the Smiths came from. It's definitely true. Definitely for uh, for American Smiths fans, Manchester is, is this mythical place yes. that that we've like traveled in our minds using those songs as a map. It does uh, exist. It's a real place. Literally every time my <laughs> wife and I cross the Williamsburg Bridge, we go the Iron Bridge. <laughs> if, every single time, we've never been to the Iron Bridge, yeah. but it's it's a city that we know through these songs. And uh, so all the Manchester stuff was totally new. Uh, the stuff about the Irishness of the band members, mm -hmm. a, a, a lot of that stuff is going to be totally new to Americans reading this. As you said, a lot of the other books about the Smiths have been more, uh, more by English for mm -hmm. English readers. And, and for Americans, the, there was something sort of exotic about the, the Manchester. Yeah. Um, 
I, I, I was in Manchester just, just, just a week ago. Uh, Manchester is anything but exotic. I have to, <laughs> I have to tell you. Who here has been to Manchester? Oh, yeah, sure. All right. So does, does, does anybody want to keep their hands up? Who here thinks mm. Manchester is exotic? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Those of us who haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Manchester is a fascinating city. I, the first time I went there uh, was, uh, I, I was born in the north of England but raised in London and uh, was very aware of the north-south divide. I consider myself a Londoner. My mother, mother has since moved back to, the, to Yorkshire where I was born and sort of got rediscovered a lot of my York, Yorkshire roots. First time I went to Manchester was a 16-year-old to see the jam and I um, didn't tell my best friend the, I did tell him we, we were going to be on the guest list, but I didn't tell him that when we were going up by bus because we couldn't afford a train that the last bus back was at 8 o'clock and the jam were going on stage at 9. So I told him that after the show. And um, we ended up walking the streets of Manchester all night. Wow. Uh, it was really, really scary back then. And, you know, it's, it's marginally less scary now. It's still a big, tough city. And that 1980 is around the time that Johnny Marr's really formulating his ideas. It's that period that, that Morrissey's sitting in his bedroom really and the economy in, in Britain was going was a mess anyway but in Manchester I found the Manchester census from 1981 and it had comparisons to the other cities and in every category Manchester was either at the top or the bottom I mean the top was the bottom you know if it was like <laughs> you know most uh, single parent families it was Manchester most people renting rather than owning it was Manchester most percentage of people without a car it was Manchester so it's a very tough city and Morrissey has said in some interview actually not too long ago that uh, you know, with all the rain up there, it's, you know, people are poor, it rains a lot, it's not like we can go off skiing, we, we sit indoors and we make music. <laughs> uh, but would you talk about American kids in the, in the passage you read about American kids wanting to be dark and northern mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the, the really inept way that we learned this from these mm -hmm. records, uh, it, it, it's very much like a huge part of their impact in America is not watering down that sort of that Englishness mm -hmm. and that Manchesterness. Right. I mean, I can't profess, I, I, I first came to the States in 86, I didn't see the Smiths play here. Uh, I got a sense of the alternative, yeah, my word back then was sort of alternative because I was going to what seemed to be alternative dance floors. But I would, I, I, that's, if there's a question there, I can't really answer it. I, I, am, I am somewhat fascinated by how the Smiths impacted in America because honestly in Britain, I mean, this question has come up while I was back in the UK. Surely the Americans couldn't get it. Surely they couldn't get all these English references, which is why I think that quote from Colin Malloy is so important, because he says, my thing is that you don't need to know uh, where Wally Range is. You don't even need to know that Wally Range exists to understand that line. What do we get for our trouble and pain, a rented room in Wally Range? To, it, it could be a made up place. I think that everybody gets that, right? Yeah. Um, not knowing it, it, you know, not knowing these references, you know, you don't have to know what Birkenhead is to know mm -hmm. that a tattooed boy from Birkenhead right. who really opens your eyes, that's something that, that means a certain, that, that sort of cultural code that comes across in that, in the Smith's iconography, the, you know, the amazing album photo of the Salford Lads Club. Yes. Um, it, it, it seems like for American kids, uh, that was a huge part of it. Another way that this book is really different from other Smith's books in a way that's really amazing is it's not just a book about Morrissey. That the interaction between these group members hasn't really been explored in this level before. It, it was really, really, really important to me. The the one the the one other biography on the Smiths, which is a, a perfectly good biography by Johnny Rogan, came out in 1992. Uh, you know, its title was Morrissey and Marr, the Severed Alliance, and and then Morrissey was the only person on the cover. Uh, the <laughs> the updated edition has has Morrissey and Marr, but it still doesn't say the Smiths. And it's, there have been biographies on Morrissey, one that, that I like that's very funny called St. Morrissey, that's, that's, uh, yeah. uh, that, that is really quite hilarious. It's sort of armchair psychology, but it's, it's good armchair psychology. Yeah. But the, yeah, there's, there, I recognize, especially in America, there's a cult of Morrissey. And there's more of a cult of Morrissey in America than, than in, in Britain. I, 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 there's lots of reasons for that. Maybe, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. I just thought this is a band. This is going to be a book about the band. And yes, Morrissey and Ma were more equal than the other members of the band. And that's also something we can talk about. But uh, I was very clear, and it was no, no problem with either of the, the, the editors who were in this room, that all four Smiths would be on the cover. 
that, that this had to be a book about the band. And I, and I don't think, and despite what Morrissey said in the court, that uh, the, 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 the bassist and drummer was interchangeable as pieces of a lawnmower, that's revisionist, absolutely revisionist, <laughs> revisionist thinking. Um, they were not. And, you know, when you look at, you know, this is the UK cover, but when you look at them, I mean, they almost look like they're, they're from the same family. You can probably see the Irishness. In, the, in that band, once you know they're all from Irish backgrounds. So very, very, very much a band. And, and I cannot imagine it having been the same with, with different members. And that's something, and, and the interaction between the personalities and, and the way that they could, that they had elements in their personalities that allowed them to function together, that when something was out of whack, it, the whole thing fell apart. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems really strange that, I mean, as, as you say, there's a cult of Morrissey, yet mm -hmm. the interaction between the band members, which uh, none of them duplicated with any other musicians of the many musicians that they've worked with, uh, what do you think it was about those four personalities getting together? Well, well one of the things I think we all love about, uh, about music, rock music, pop music, is, bands, is, is this intangible. It's like when the, when, when the group becomes bigger than the sum of its parts, and it's true of the Beatles, it's, I mean, it's true of every group. And you know, with the Smiths, the, 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 the thing that's here that, that uh, is, the reason I'm pausing is it's really hard to put into words. When you think that Morrissey had been through his period of trying to be in bands, and failed miserably. I mean, he was auditioning to replace punk singers who had gotten out of the, you know, jumped off the bandwagon, and Morrissey was trying to jump on the, you know, the, 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 the hardcore punk bandwagon and failing auditions, or the band would last two gigs, retreats to his bedroom. Everybody in Manchester says, Morrissey, that boy had talent, but it's not going to happen. I mean, we, we all see this. Somebody has talent, but he didn't know how to make, make the most of it. Johnny Marr, who's got all this energy and really is looking for a partner, somehow thinks this guy that supposedly has been written off may just be worth my going to see him. And he goes up and he gets himself really together and he knocks on, on Morrissey's door with, with a mutual friend in tow, because Morrissey would not have answered the, the door if he didn't recognize at least one of the two people. <laughs> I mean, he wouldn't have done. There's no way he'd have... He just said, you're Jehovah's, you know, go away. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, Morrissey answered the door and Johnny said, hey, I've heard about you and, and, and do you think we can, you know, should we try writing songs together? And the, the question is, is, of course, what would have happened to Morrissey if Johnny hadn't knocked on the door? And yet the fact is Johnny did knock on the door. And so if Morrissey was sort of sitting there waiting for somebody to knock on his door, it, it <laughs> happened. And, and the, the Morrissey-Ma thing, it does drive the Smiths. So, so we recognize they are the centerpiece of the story and then they get then the rhythm section becomes sort of the, the backup. But in terms of how these personalities came together, Morrissey and Marr, it's a unique partnership. But there is more to it than that. Johnny Marr and Andy Rock went to school together. And that's, I think people have often felt there was, there's Morrissey and Marr, and then there's a rhythm section. Well, actually, there was Johnny and Andy all the way from the age of 12 to, to 16, 17, when, when Johnny and Andy fell out, um, actually kind of over, over Andy's lifestyle. And, and yet, when Johnny got partnered up with Morrissey, and then when he found Mike Joyce, he realized that really he had to go back and, and, and make up with this, this, his best friend because this was the only bass player he could imagine playing with. And there were multiple dynamics in that band. There were like you know, Morrissey and Marr, there was Morrissey, there was Johnny and Andy, there was the rhythm section, you know, Andy and Mike roomed together and were often seen together and hung out late at night together. And then there was the three of them, the three playing members except Morrissey. And I think all these dynamics worked for the time that the Smiths were together. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's something in the book that those different dynamics is something that, uh, and you know, for most of us who read it, it this will all be new. Uh, particularly uh, the way the three of them who weren't Morrissey, and, and particularly the, the sort of the way that they were open to rock and roll hedonism mm -hmm. in a way that Morrissey wasn't, which I, I think for 95% of at least American readers, it's going to be shocking. Uh, the consumption of drugs in this book yeah. uh, is, is going to be new and and completely unknown and completely shocking. The idea that that was part of their working and, and their traveling as, as musicians, young musicians having a good time on the road. Uh, whereas, you know, our, our fantasy of the Smiths was very different. Well, that's a, 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 key, a key point because Morrissey projected himself as almost being 
because he said he was vegetarian, which he was, and because he said he was celibate, which he, he may or may not have been, <laughs> and he did have a quote, and it is in the book, and I won't try and find it, I don't smoke cigarettes. I think he said something about I hardly drink, which really wasn't quite true. That I think people got the idea that the Smiths were Fugazi. You know, that this, was, <laughs> that this, this was like a straight-edge band. But as that, as that production manager says in that, that quote that I read, these are three northern working-class lads you know, from the north of England, and, uh, and you send them abroad, and they are going to have fun. And they're gonna, and, and Mike Joyce gave a great quote, not to me, I'm afraid, but he gave a great quote. Um, the next tour fell short, the second American tour. Uh, they were managerless and they got to Florida and they couldn't make it through the four last shows to New York and they had Radio City Music Hall sold out. That's you know, five and a half thousand expectant fans. I mean, there's been a novel written about that moment alone. <laughs> and um, they, they, the, the wheels came off the tour effectively. They just could not make it back to New York, I think, because they, they just had burned it too much. And Mike Joyce has subsequently said, yeah, it's true, we were burning the candle at both ends and right down the middle. Yeah. <laughs> it's so because it's so, you know, we thought of the Smiths as so above all that. You know, it's, it's funny because I, I think of like their, their American tour in 86 mm -hmm. in that summer, uh, which you know, turned out to be the last one. And, mm -hmm. and the idea that, uh, that there was so much hedonism yeah. as part of that, like, touring experience, uh, is, it would have been so shocking to most of the, the people who like, went and what, to see that show. And something that's interesting, though, they'd already gone through this uh, f period where uh, earlier that year Andy Rourke was thrown out of the band because he, he, had, he brought a heroin addiction into the band, and it wasn't needles. It was, uh, it was a kind of... Oddly enough, he's the only member of the band who isn't really strictly working class, but he lived in an environment where his brothers became, um, be became dealers, and it's it very easy to go down a slippery slope. And uh, he did get thrown out of the band because there were different forms of hedonism that were acceptable. So this was an, an unacceptable one. Um, and I do make the point that for Morrissey, this would have been a great concern because the back of the British music papers at that point, that heroin was such a problem in Britain that the, uh, some, you know, the government, I guess, at the end of the day, the government was paying to put full page ads on the back of the music papers, uh, basically saying your heroin will fuck you up, which obviously it will, and don't do it. And um, so, and there's Morrissey being being like, I don't smoke, and I don't, you know, I, I, I don't eat animals, and I'm celibate. And it would have been had had Andy's uh, addiction come out, and the band not be seen to doing anything about it, that would have been a big, a big, big problem. Yeah. But I think when you're that young, um, you can. I've seen this a lot. I, I had a period where I was actually putting on gigs in in New York in the early '90s. And I, I, when you're 20, 21 years old, it's amazing what your body can do. You can stay up all night. And you can sleep on the tour bus or you can go shopping and you can just go right into the next day. And I think to be fair to the Smiths, because we don't get hung up on this, apart from supposedly one or two gigs in Ireland where Andy's problem was noticeable, although I've heard a tape of the show that got him thrown out and it's not as bad as, as you would think. Uh, the Smiths delivered, I think, every single night. I mean, if anybody here saw the Smiths and saw a bad show, probably the band would like to hear from you about it because I, I think they genuinely believe they did not turn in a bad show. And I, I think Johnny got very caught up in that kind of Keith Richards uh, uh, glamour, glamorous image that you can party and function. But, but Johnny has also been keen to state he was not a pub boy. He didn't drink beer. Hmm. He wasn't somebody that sort of you know, went down the pub drinking beer. He wanted to make music. So as a 17-year-old, uh, rather than going down the pub, which is what most people in England would, would do, he would be in a studio, a, re a rehearsal room. He would be getting stoned out of his head on, on smoke. And the Smiths were massive on that, and they would never deny that. But, but that, was, that was really their drug of choice. They found they could function. A song like How Soon Is Now came out of a very old combination of staying up all night, smoking a lot of weed, and doing a lot of cheap speed. <laughs> <laughs> wow, which did not sum up the lifestyle of those of us who were listening to it. No, I know, I know. <laughs> so the thing when you write books, you, have a, you, 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 burst, people, you burst the bubbles. You kind of... Uh, you have to burst people's bubbles. What are, one of the things, and one of the things I love about this book is you're you're gentle with some of the bubbles that you're bursting. It's it's kind of it, but the, there's this one anecdote that I love. It's the first time they're in New York. It's New Year's Eve, and mm -hmm. Morrissey has a little red wine and yeah. doesn't make it all the way through the show. He falls off stage. He falls off stage. Yes, yeah, there were, falls off stage. They, which that part was documented, but there's 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 there's, there's there were these British movies called Carry On. These Carry On <laughs> movies that are as campers. Anything comes. I mean, they were actually full of repressed 
homosexuals in starring roles that pretty much everybody knew was homosexual, but you couldn't admit it. And it's no surprise that Morrissey looked up to these people. And uh, Jeff Travis of Rough Traders likened the story of the Smiths to a Carry On movie. And so Morrissey on that New Year's Eve got uh, very drunk at dinner, uh, probably just for nerves. I know, I mean, a lot of people do that, drank a lot of red wine and kind of took to the stage and it's New Year's Eve and he fell off the stage. And the next day, Jeff Travis gets a phone call from England from Morrissey's mother say, uh, saying that, that you know, how could they not look after Morrissey properly and how, how, could they, how could they possibly let him fall off the stage <laughs> and why didn't they take him to hospital and so on. And uh, uh, you can imagine people saying, he just fell off a stage. I mean, a lot of people would jump off a stage. Right now, but, yes, some of, that, some of that stuff happened. But I think for the most part, the Smiths turned it in. They, they turned in incredibly great shows. I wish I'd seen them more. I think we all thought they were going to last longer. I saw them half a dozen times, and every time they were superb. Absolutely superb. Yeah, well, and they had, and, and you talk about the end of their career as a band, and, uh, and, and the fact that, you know, sad as it is that they ended, they never, uh, they never got to the phase where they were making routine or mediocre or bad mm -hmm. records, and that's you know it's a mixed bless. It's it's a element of their legacy, but it's a, a painful it, one. It's a real mixed blessing because I make the comparison, and I'm I'm happy to stand by it that I see a lot of similarities between REM and the Smiths, and I have written a, a biography on REM that's been sort of updated every few years. And I have just completed what had better be a final update because the band, <laughs> the band broke up and they broke up amicably. And I am so full of admiration for REM. And I, I look at the Smiths as, God, if you could only have had a manager or trusted your first manager, Joe Moss, the way that REM trusted their manager for large chunks of their career. And, and it all worked out. And yet, within all of that, there's an argument that says the Smiths could have been as big as REM. They could have made an automatic for the people that, that is... is uh, revered around the world and yet you look at a band like R.E.M. and it's an arc I mean it goes up and it kind of comes back down and it, yeah, there is a dud album in there now out of 15 albums to have only one that the band considers a dud is a great track record but the Smiths have no duds yeah. I got into trouble for saying there's one song out of their 70 that they composed and recorded is not up to standard. And I mean, I got taken to task on that. So Smith fans obviously feel that every single Smith song is a classic. There are Golden Lights defenders. There are. <laughs> there, there, there are. And actually, Golden Lights is not the song because they didn't write that. But, but, you're, but you're, you're opposed to Golden Lights. You come down yeah, yeah, on it pretty hard. It, yeah, it is. Uh, they, <laughs> yes, it's pretty bad, actually. <laughs> Uh, what's the one that you think is the one that I think and, and we had this out at um, when we did this event in London and the Smiths producer was there, a guy who produced it Stephen Street and I said well it's, wow. uh, I think it's death, death at One's Elbow it's yeah. the penultimate track on the last album and a penultimate track is a great place to hide away your weakest song I think that if you pick up great albums you'll go yeah that's the one and I think it sets the stall for Morrissey's rockabilly infatuation I mean I think it it sounds like to me a b-side from a future Morrissey single but Stephen Street agreed and he said no that's 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 not I, I think he I, I, what did he say Jesse basically agreed didn't he, he yeah, said it's yeah. not the not the strongest song it's not a great moment wow. wow but I had a reviewer in Britain take me to task for, for daring to suggest that <laughs> one of 70 songs was inconsequential um, <laughs> because this yeah this critic was a fan and uh, somehow he couldn't separate the two and it's like but you you cannot write a biography and, and say they're less than perfect yeah but and, and but for a band that had no decline phase which mm. is like the really like the surprising thing about bands like this, there's always the question, could it have been saved? Yes. And this, this is hypothetical because it wasn't saved, but there are very few people you talk to who say it couldn't have been saved. The, the band really broke up because on a, on a very literal matter of fact level, Johnny Marr was so overworked from largely taking care of a lot of the band's management because Morrissey would keep firing the managers and Morrissey fired the final manager of the Smiths and Johnny kind of put his hands up and said no more. I mean, we, we've got to figure out how we're going to do this. I am not going to go back and do the work that I keep doing. And, he, and they, they recorded Strange Ways. They were thrilled with it. They thought it was their best work. They thought they were moving forward. And Johnny said, I just need a holiday. And Talking Heads want me to play with them. And Brian Ferry's had me play with them. And I just, I want to do some of this stuff because I'm 23 and it's my moment. And it, don't take it personally. Just, just, I just want some breathing space. And the others took it personally and pushed, it, pushed Johnny into doing this B-side session that was a disaster. And they, the, the final song that they recorded was a Scylla Black 
single from a from a British movie, and it's called "Work Is a Four Letter Word." And Johnny Marr took that "Right, You're Wrong" as Morrissey's uh, uh, actually almost writing the lyrics to him. So their paranoia was such that he couldn't just sit with Morrissey and say, "Is this meant to be a message to me?" He just took it as a message to him, and he went on his holiday. And uh, when he came back, uh, the, 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 there were rumours that the Smiths had broken up and he decided to just confirm the rumours. So the question is, had they given him six months off? Had they given the, themselves six months off? Would they have survived? Could they have thrived? Johnny, I pushed him so hard on this when I was interviewing him because I didn't want to take his standard. No, it was time, it was time. The most I got out of him was, had they given me that break, I think that there was another year, another album left in the band. I don't think, knowing where my head was going and where Morrissey's head was going or not going, because I think part of the problem was Morrissey was very comfortable doing what he was doing. And, and to a large degree, Morrissey is still doing what he is doing. I mean, it hasn't changed drastically, if at all. And uh, Johnny wanted to move on. So Johnny's, Johnny's argument is we, we would have made one more album at most. But the point is, who knows? Yeah. Because if they could have had that space, come back and made a, a fifth album, maybe it would have been so great that they would have carried on. So I think it's a shame. I mean, there, there is a, a kind of jokey aspect in the front of the book. I say I was tempted to call this book How Not to Succeed in the Music Business. Because <laughs> the Smiths just did everything wrong, uh, particularly not trusting a manager. You cannot get that big and not have a trusted manager. And yet, the, the, the flip side is they did succeed because, because look at the music. Look at the fact that we're talking about them. So you yeah. can argue this one both ways. And, and uh, I think ultimately you have to say it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, I'll have more questions, but I'm sure uh, other people have uh, sure. questions. Can we open it up? Is there, is there any plans for a documentary? There have been, uh, actually, this goes back to how much the, the, the Smiths mean in Britain. There have been umpteen uh, mini documentaries on the Smiths. And Has anyone contacted you and said, oh, no, okay, not this yet. is the template? Uh, no, not yet. Um, that could happen. The, I mean, literally, when I was in England, there was a documentary on Radio 4 about Strange Days, Here We Come. I think they were, they were doing a series of swan songs, group's final albums. And I noticed that even Johnny didn't talk for this one. So just Andy and Mike. Uh, I, I think it's almost been ruined by too many, too many half-baked documentaries, to be, to be honest with you. What do we have? People must have questions. Everything you wanted to know about the Smiths, but we're afraid to ask. Well, um, I'm from Cleveland originally. I'm fans of a lot of bands from Minneapolis yeah. from the 80s, so we can do Dark and Northern really well. <laughs> 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 you know, and actually, I think there's weird parallels between Who's Purdue and the Smiths, but that's a whole okay. talk. But you did mention R.E.M. and you have written on them. And yeah, the first, I walked in, I bought that first Smiths record, and I asked the guy, what's this like? And he goes, well, I don't know, it's kind of like a British R.E.M. or something. Now, as you said to me, I found that to be the jingly guitar and the enigmatic lead scene and all that. Did they, I assume they did, but what did they think, each band think about the other's music? Did they care? Did they follow the other? It's a good, that's actually a great question. R.E.M. were really pissed off to get to Britain in 1983 with an album that had sold 200,000 in America and they'd been together since 1980, had a single out in 81, EP out in 82, an album that sold enough for them to come to the UK. Like yeah, toured like crazy. Everybody just says, Wow, you sound just like the Smiths, <laughs> which, which is what people said. And they, people, I think, dumb people who were pretty dumb about it may have even said, "Were you influenced by the Smiths?" I know REM were, were really ticked off about that. Funny enough, of course, the Smiths would get to America, and people would say, "Are you influenced by REM?" And, I, and, and certainly, REM could not have been influenced by the Smiths. The Smiths could have been influenced by REM, but were not. It was not on their radar. By the time Murmur hit in Britain, because I was, I was really bowled over by Murmur. I mean, I was fortunate enough to be around the very early days of the Smiths, but I got into R.E.M. with Murmur in late 83, and it knocked me sideways. But by that point, the Smiths had a hit single with This Charming Man, so they didn't need to be influenced. Now, in time, they both came to really respect each other as bands. And the last time I saw R.E.M. play, this is really poetic, last time I saw R.E.M. play, Modest Mouse was a support act, and at that point, Johnny Marr was in Modest Mouse. And the very last time I saw R.E.M. play a show was uh, two, the two encores with Johnny Marr and Peter Buck up front of the stage oh together, God. both on Rickenbackers, uh, doing South Central Rain, and I'm pretty sure the other one was actually Man on the Moon. And those, the, so, so my sort of fade out with R.E.M. is also kind of a, a fade into doing this book on the Smiths, and it's kind of an interesting, an interesting thing. 
Yeah. And actually, we know you were talking, asking how long I was on this book. I, I remember seeing Johnny Marr um, backstage at one of those shows, and I know the book was not something to mention at that point. So, so the idea certainly came up after whenever that last show was that I saw. Wow. Yeah. I see a lot of comparisons. I think they're both, they're, a lot of comparisons, you know, for lead singer on down, but maybe Michael Stipe had a wider artistic vision. I was just talking about Morrissey uh, being very much rooted in his place, being very comfortable in his place. And I think Michael Stipe is, is you know, a visual artist as well as a singer. And, and maybe, maybe that made a difference. I, I'm just, when we were talking about giving Johnny Marr a holiday, well, I think Michael Stipe didn't mind giving Peter Buck a holiday to go off and play with 18 other bands because Michael wanted to go off and take pictures and yeah. do his thing. So maybe, maybe there's a big difference there. Yeah. And, and, and as you pointed out, they, they kept the manager that they started with yes. and they lucked out with that. Yeah. And it's funny what a difference that makes. It makes an enormous difference. I think you have to trust people at some point. This is, even if it doesn't work out, record companies sign you and you generally can't get out of the deal. Uh, same with your publishing company. I mean, at some point, you need to just say, this person's our manager, and we'll give him a couple of years. And if he makes really bad decisions, we'll fire him. But you don't sort of say, well, can you work for us for one tour? And then, <laughs> and then sort of say, okay, well, we don't need a manager for the next six months. And, and you know, forget to pay the manager who just worked for you. Oh. So you hinted that you were going to tell us why is it Morrissey would not be the cult figure in the UK? Oh, okay. I think because the Smiths still mean so much. Okay, that's, a, that's yeah. Um, the way I see it in America is that the Smiths were on this upward trajectory and they reached the point with their last album uh, that, uh, well, they reached the point when they toured The Queen Is Dead that it was going to take off. And then in 1987, both um, um, Louder Than Bombs, which was the American double album compilation, and Strange Ways, Here We Come, both went gold in America. Uh, which is half a million sales, which is pretty phenomenal. And the band didn't tour. They, they didn't tour again. They didn't even make videos for those, for those albums. And I think what happened is when the Smiths broke up, there were half a million American fans who said, well, I want this to continue. And Morrissey said, I'll continue it for you. So they transferred a, a very sort of nascent love of the Smiths into a very sort of passionate long-term love affair with Morrissey. And American audiences are traditionally very, very, very loyal. Uh, much more so than in Britain, where trends come and go in, in as much time as it took me to read that, that, that opening section. And I think in Britain, the Smiths were massive. They, they, they had number one albums. And there's a sense of this was a group. And uh, although Johnny Marr got a lot of stick for, for breaking up the Smiths, there was still the sense Johnny's doing his thing, well, Morrissey's doing his thing. And after a couple of albums, I think the, the British got a little... The, not the British Morrissey fans, but the British meaning the media, the tastemakers. I think they sort of said, OK, well, Morrissey's a one, a one-trick pony, and we can put him in that box over here. Whereas the Morrissey personality just seemed to speak to these American kids. I mean, I went to see Morrissey in Albany just a few weeks ago, and as ever, there were, there were 18-year-olds there. It's astonishing. I, and it, I mean, it really is astonishing. And there was this, this I was standing out in the, um, uh, the, the sort of foyer afterwards, just waiting for, waiting for my wife. And there was uh, this girl um, talking to this boy that were both very young and very obviously uh, really into the Smiths. And then this other girl came out who was absolutely, you know, very, ob I mean, I, if it sounds like I'm typecasting to say that, that she was very obviously lesbian, the first thing she said to this, this boy was, was Hi, I see you've met my girlfriend, and you know what? When Morrissey took his shirt off, I'm like, Morrissey, I'm straight. Morrissey, I'm straight. <laughs> it, it's amazing the the, the 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 cult that is around the Morrissey to, to this day, and it, it, and yes, it is very very different in America. It it really is. He gets those kids in every generation, and mm -hmm. it's it's you know the Morrissey kid gravitates to Morrissey. Nobody really has replaced yes. that like. Well, there's a question maybe, maybe for you, and maybe if anybody else has an answer. Why has nobody else replaced Morrissey in, in the affections of American youth, disaffected youth's hearts? Well, it's really strange. His, uh, mm -hmm. he, because he's not American, he can get away with a lot of things that an American... Uh, it, American the way people have rules for their own people mm -hmm. that that they will allow, you know, an exotic like Morrissey. And because Morrissey's always got that exoticness, no matter how long he was living in L.A., uh, it was always his, his dark and northernness mm -hmm. that, was, that was his main appeal to that cult. And the idea that you could become dark and northern just by listening, you know, that, that's a very powerful fantasy to a disaffected American teen. Right. It's curious, though. I mean, Americans... I mean, obviously, Kurt, Kurt Cobain killed himself, so he took himself out of the equation. But... Um, 
It is curious that there's not a figure like that that can still mean something to 18-year-olds who will go see this 50-something-year-old guy on stage and, and literally say, oh, my God, you know, you would turn me straight. Yeah. Uh, That's amazing. I'm just going to ask about, you know, why you think the other members of the band went immediately and just kept on making music with Morris even without Johnny. And even though they were treated so poorly by him, I mean, that first gig he did mm -hmm. was the Smiths minus Johnny. Just, just curious that they would do that, given all that had happened and kind of the struggle that they had at the end and how they immediately, you know, kept that going with him. I'm curious about that as well. I don't think it really makes sense. The part that's even more curious is Johnny, this part that we talked about, Johnny takes his holiday and there's reports in the enemy in Britain, the Smiths to split. And, and, and actually, Mark, Johnny Marr took advice from the final Smiths manager who'd stayed friends with, who said, don't rise to the bait, don't say anything, just don't say anything, you'll regret it. And Johnny ignores the advice, picks up the phone, calls the enemy and said, yes, the Smiths are split, I've left the band. And, and the very next week, the Smiths go into the studio and start auditioning new guitarists and uh, issue a, a press statement saying, uh, yes, Johnny Marr has left the band, but the Smiths will continue. And Morrissey starts doing interviews for Strangeways album, saying, well, yes, it's very sad, but it's not the end of the Smiths by any means. And the journalists were sitting there and going, I'm, I'm really sorry, Morrissey, it is. And I think that part, Johnny, Johnny has said that, that, that that, more than anything else, did it for him, that... that all right, I'm already pissed off. I, mean, I already feel like there's all this weird stuff going on. But then, all right, I say I've gone. And I know that in a way you should say, all right, you've gone. But, but the next week, it's like one of the, you know, <laughs> the next week you're auditioning new, like any hope that possibly existed yeah. that I might have been changed my mind, that I might have said, yes, that was a, we, we've all been rash. Let's give ourselves time to think. If you're going to audition a new guitarist next week, I'm, I'm really done. And of course, Johnny co-owned the Smiths' name, so there was no way it was going to be the Smiths. And I don't really get that part about, I think some people, I think the brutal answer is some people needed work. Um, because it, it was weird seeing that Morrissey show as Morrissey, it was, it was a five piece, what was it, a four piece band, which it just didn't have Johnny Mike, even had Craig Gannon, the, the, the brief fifth Smith. Yeah. It's very strange, and that was, that was uh, massive at the time. And then, uh, and then by, by the point that they did that show, oddly enough, Mike and Andy had already instigated proceedings to to uh, uh, yeah, their own legal proceedings, and Craig Gannon had them going. So at the point that they were playing that show, Morrissey was already actually facing legal action from his four backing members, three backing members. <laughs> I, I, strange. I remember watching MTV in the spring of 1989, yeah. seeing the video for the last of the famous international yeah. Playboys, and I'm watching the video, and I said, like, "Hey, I know that guy, the drummer. Like, mm -hmm. hey, the bassist." I was like, "They're all." I was like. Johnny will be back by Christmas. Mm -hmm. I, I, I said, this is it. We're, we're going to act like it was all yeah. a bad dream we had. Yes. I, I, part of me still feels that way. I think, it, yeah, I think probably for a lot of people it feels, feels yeah. that way. Jo Johnny is um, really, really adamant that he, his life has been the way it was meant to be. That he is always somebody who, and you can see this from his career, he's got a uh, commitment of two or three years to a project. He'll do a couple of albums, a couple of tours, and, 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 and gets itchy and wants to move on. So he, f he feels, hey, this is how my life was meant to be. And uh, he also feels, hey, this, you know, Morrissey was, a, was this incredible performer, and that's how his life was meant to be. But I don't, know, I don't actually have this bookmark, but I was talking about this with somebody last night, and I'll find, I know exactly where it is. Uh, I, yeah, actually, these are the two quotes. That, that at, the, at the start of each chapter, I've got a couple of just intro quotes. And uh, Johnny's quote to me was, I think my life has turned out as it was meant to be. And I would suggest that Morrissey's has too. Absolutely, I really would. But uh, Morrissey's quote from 1991 is really more telling. He says, it was a special musical relationship, and those are few and far between. For Johnny and I, it won't come again. I think he knows that, and I know it. The Smiths had the best of Johnny and me. Those were definitely the days. Wow. I mean, that's that's sad. Yeah. And the fact that he 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 recognizes it. I mean, that is kind of sad. And I, I I tend to think he's right. With no disrespect to, to what either of them have achieved since, I tend to think he's right. And it comes back to that uh, uh, incredible intangible of of you put these two people together and it feels like they shouldn't get on. And what happens is they form one of the greatest bands going. Uh, this is kind of, oh, I'm 
meta question. What do you think about the difference in the UK and the US cover? And are there any differences <laughs> in the US edition that had to be made? Like, I don't know, from words change to just like... No, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm really glad to have two, two covers. I think it's great. Um, and really, the way, that, the way that that works is, is individual <laughs> publishers in different countries really design the cover that works for them, and the author has, uh, has say in it, but, but really the publisher leads that discussion, and uh, both editors are in this room, and I believe both editors are really happy with the cover that they've got. Uh, the only differences inside are American spelling and grammar. And the, the, although I'm British, I've ended up with, with the American Microsoft Word, and it Americanizes everything I do. And I, I also uh, speak, I try desperately to hold on. My, my, my two kids are both American, and uh, the older one gives me, gives me hell for using English words. Uh, uh, anyway, I was going to do a long worded ramble in terms of defending the word garage. But um, <laughs> because the Clash did not sing, we are a garage band. Right? And I hold on to that one to the bitter end. But. Um, <laughs> there are some. There were, there were some Americanisms that got into the English edition because there, there were I, some, somebody actually spotted. It was actually Johnny Rogan. Only Johnny Rogan would read through the book and send me an email with all the uh, with with all the uh, Anglicisms or the Americanisms that shouldn't have been. And apparently, we use the room homeroom and math. Math in America is singular, isn't it? Yeah. In Britain, it's it's plural. And we did something else, and they were all on one page, all to do with schools. And Johnny Rogan wrote it. And I was like, thank you, Johnny. Very nice of you to point that out. What about guts as goods? It takes goods to be gentle and kind? Is that, is that just more seeing that one song? I think or is it's that just pronunciation. Is it, it, do, do other people pronounce it that way in no, that part of England? No, not really. <laughs> no. See, we, we learned these words and these pronunciations yes. just from Smith's record, so we don't know. Well, them. yeah, I guess, I guess that's, that, that's true. Although it's interesting, Morrissey, Morrissey developed a very uh, transatlantic accent kind of quite early on. He, he, but largely due to his mother's influence, he rose above his station. Or he, no, that's not the word. There, there was a criticism people use, acting above his station. So he actually developed a voice above his station in life very, very early on. And it turned out to be fine because he turned out to be a very literate, successful pop star. But he doesn't speak like the others speak. If you hear the others speak, it's very Mancunian. It's very interesting. Yeah. interesting. Yeah. Have, have Warren and Morrissey ever crossed paths since <laughs> they uh, broke up? Just ah. Even just in a very casual setting? They have done, yes. Are they cordial to each other? Everybody asks, is asking me this right now. It's really difficult because I feel like I'm meant to be a, a, some kind of spokesman for them, which I, 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 I'm not. I... Let me put it this way: I don't believe it's cordial enough that a, uh, re a, a, a reunion is on the cards. Well, I'm not saying that, but if, if you had a guess behind closed doors, are they cordial to each other? Yeah, I, as far as I know, they have to they have to work together because they co-own everything, and I think at this point there must be times when you don't want to do it through the lawyers and the managers, and you may just want to say, "Hey, do you agree to doing this commercial?" Um, yeah, what's your thoughts on this? So, so my understanding, I feel like I'm going to slightly. Uh, Slightly tentative ground there, but my understanding is that they communicate with each other, and it may not be for me to say how healthy or unhealthy that communication is. What is your feeling? You, you saw the recent American tour. I did too. I <clears throat> yeah. saw the show a couple of months ago. Uh, what, what's your feeling about Morrissey beginning again to do Smith songs live? Well, hasn't he always done some of them? He didn't well, in the in the nineties and in the nineties, the early nineties anyway. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, well, you know, Johnny's been coming out. Johnny's got a solo album coming out next year. It's taken him to the age of 50 to be comfortable enough to, or 49, to be comfortable enough to, to make a solo album. Johnny also plays Smith songs. And I am completely comfortable with each of them doing that. I, I think if you co-write a song, you absolutely have ownership of it. You obviously set up a comparison to your previous band, but that's, that's, that's what happens when you, your band breaks up. I'm, I'm totally fine with them doing that. I thought Morrissey did a particularly good version of Meet His Murder, which I'm not sure was necessarily the Smiths' high point live. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not sure that that song, I've listened to a lot of live tapes of the Smiths, as you might imagine, over the last, last few years, and I'm not sure that that song really came off live. I was very impressed by uh, Morrissey's delivery of it in, mm. on, on this current solo tour. Yeah. Did you speak with Morrissey for this book? No, I did not. Did nope. Did he refuse or...? Well, he didn't... Uh, he, he was just very Morrissey-esque about it. He just didn't reply. Um, 
No, I'm very, very open about that. I absolutely approached him, and I approached him several times with very uh, uh, cordial professional correspondence, which uh, his assistants uh, assured me reached him. I have to say, I went into this not expecting Morrissey's cooperation. The nature of Morrissey, I, this I, I actually mean this as a compliment. I consider Morrissey um, a diva, and I don't mean that in any negative term at all. And I think that divas are people who are very controlling of their publicity and their message. And that Morrissey at this is not, never going to consent to give his cooperation to any book, to any biography but, but his own. And so I did not expect to get that help, that cooperation. I was also almost nervous that if he did say, say yes, just knowing how it's been for people who've worked with him on projects, that it, it, it could have then become more complicated. Because the good thing about Johnny and Andy and their cooperation, very trusting, both of them, is they didn't ask to see the book. Because I don't think you can do a biography and, and hand it back over. It's, it's very, very tough. You do sometimes get somebody that you interview who says, I want to know what you're printing of mine. And you say, well, I can't really do that because, yes, it is going to be out of context. I mean, I, I'm going to use one line here and a few lines there. The most I've ever done with those people is let them see the transcript so that they can tell me if I got anything wrong. So um, Johnny and Andy were very, very, very trusting to say, you know, we're going to talk to you this much in this much detail. And, and you, you've seen from those quotes that they gave me a, a lot of personal detail. And then we're going to trust you not to fuck this up. <laughs> um, so that's that's a, a big step. And I, 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 I don't think Morrissey would be able to do that um, with, with me or with any, anybody else, to be quite honest. Were they happy with it? For, uh, now that sometimes, yeah, now that, that there's been enough time for them to have gone through it, uh, I, I believe Johnny and Andy are, are, are perfectly happy with it. Yes, they've. Um, I'm in touch. I'm in contact with both of them in a, in, a, in a very cordial manner. So if there's anything that that they didn't like, they either haven't got there yet, or there's, <laughs> or there's nothing that's a big enough deal to to pick up the phone or, or write to me about it. So it's yeah, it's cool. It's, it seems like they're pretty appreciative of it. Um, can you talk about the band's relationship with New Order? Were they influenced by New Order to go with independent label? Um, that's the first question. My second question, what is your next band? Are you like it? Okay. First question is, um, no, I don't think they were much influenced by Joy Division or New Order. It's very, 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 very interesting though. So just to set the scene really, really quickly, Joy Division are on the label Factory. Joy Division, of course, become New Order when Ian Curtis dies and they decide to carry on under a different name. Factory is Manchester's big independent label, very much focused on Manchester. It's distributed by Rough Trade in London, which is both a distributor and the indie label that the Smith signed to. And the other big indie label, because there's a, a trifecta here, is Mute Records and Mute House Depeche Mode. So these are the three levels. They all do 50-50 profit splits with their bands. They all do contracts that are not much longer than, than that. And um, uh, very interesting, Morrissey seemed to have very little to say about Joy Division. Very little to say about Joy Division. It's surprising. He had a lot of opinions about a lot of other acts in Manchester, good, bad, and in between. But very little to say about Joy Division. Um, Morrissey really craved the appreciation, or even if the right, right word, the approbation of Anthony Wilson, the founder of Factory. And there's a lot of correspondence between Morrissey and, and Tony Wilson, which I couldn't print in, in too much detail. But Morrissey, Morrissey did take a tape of the Smiths to Tony Wilson. Johnny's thing is, well, we never would have signed to Factory because it wasn't the right label for us. But Morrissey certainly wanted to be offered the deal. I think that uh, they were then quite influenced probably by New Order, probably in terms of New Order's obstinacy. Uh, the fact that New Order, I mean, there is this thing about bands coming out of Manchester that, that are really like, we would just do things our way. And New Order did come across as, as uh, way more obstropolis than, than, than the Smiths. I mean, the Smiths refused to make videos, but New Order, it, it's all just, we would just do things our way completely and totally. And it worked for New Order, and to a degree, it worked for the Smiths. But I don't think there was a lot of influence. I think that Johnny, um, both Morrissey and Johnny went to the Hacienda when it opened quite a lot. Um, 
but I think Johnny well, Johnny came through a lot of dance music. Johnny was listening to a lot of the same black American early 80s hip hop electro that was on the dance floor at the Hacienda. He then got in, engaged in the Smiths, but you can still hear some of that. You can hear it in Barbarism and Begins at Home and some other things. And I think Johnny was getting itchy by the end of the Smiths because although he didn't necessarily know Acid House was happening, he knew something was happening. And it's instructive that, that the first actual proper group he does after the Smiths that he is credited for is uh, electronic with Bernard Sumner, the singer from New Order, and uh, to some degree Neil Tennant from the Pet Shop Boys was in that. So I think Johnny was much more influenced by that dance music. As as for the next band, I honestly don't know. I I really don't know at this point. I, it, the Smiths something comes up in your book, which is always baffling to uh, particularly Americans, but I think most Smiths, uh, the fact that they think "Strange Ways Here We Come" is their best album. Mm -hmm. Which it seems like all four Smiths believe that. Mm -hmm. uh, wh why? People shaking their heads. Yeah. I think they believe it because I think it's um, uh, it's that, that 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 word for rewriting history. Where, um, the, the revisionist. revisionist. Thank you. Whoever said revisionist. Thank you. <laughs> it, I think it's revisionist, and the reason I think it is is because unfortunately none of us. In, in none of the, nobody except the four Smiths and the people closest to them got to hear that record as anything other than their swan song, knowing yeah. that they had broken up. And there's no way you can listen to it. I mean, it's going to affect your your interpretation, your lifelong relationship with that record. And you're going to be looking for the clues, and it looks like the clues are there, and the band are insistent that the clues aren't there. And that, it would be okay for uh, when the record came along for the band to say it's our best record yet, but, uh, because most bands do that and should do that. I think that they've stuck to their guns on that because I, I think it's tied in with the fact that honestly and truly, guys, we didn't know we were going to break up. Everything was fine when we made that record. It sort of all happened in six weeks afterwards. Hmm. And I think that's why they cling to that. Um, they may well disagree, but it's one of those things that, that uh, you can convince yourself to believe something. I think that, that, that musically, like te technically, it probably is their best record, but I, and I know that Morrissey and Ma think that l last night I dreamt somebody loved me is their best song or their best recording, but I think that there's a difference between your best production and your most Phil Spector-esque production and the song that means most to your fans. And that may say something about where the Smiths ended up, that that, that is a grand song and it's a great production, but I'm sure that if I had recorded it, I would be dead pleased with it. But does it communicate to, to the public the way that uh, you know, Hand in Glove does? I don't think it does. It's wild. It's, it seems like most people think of The Queen is Dead as mm -hmm. you know, the greatest album ever, certainly like you know the greatest Smiths album. And it's funny that the, the Smiths themselves are so insistent on... Yeah, it is. I, I agree that it is. But, but bands, can be, bands can be odd. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have anything else? Yeah, yeah. I noticed you uh, mentioned Jan earlier, and I found yeah. like, there's like a lot of parallels, I think, in the two stories, right down to the fact that neither band will reunite. Mm -hmm. Do you think, like, I, ju I just realized that Weller was like 23, 24 when they broke up, and he yep. was very like, this is now my project, yes. style council. Yep. Do you think there's any sort of, like, they became too huge, too fast with both bands? I think there's something about the age 23 because it's the same age that Johnny <laughs> broke up the Smiths and and uh, when I used the Paul Weller comparison to Johnny he said it's also when Andrew Lou Goldham left the Stones so that mm. tells you where Johnny's head is at that tells you Johnny's reference points uh, the reason I make comparisons to the jam it, 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 is because the jam broke up at the end of 1982 so at the start of 1983 there was a void and people don't really listen to the Smiths and go oh gosh they sound like the jam but there was a void and there was particularly a void for a spokesman and I, may, I, I go into to plenty detail on this because Paul Weller basically broke up the jam because he could not cope with the pressure of being the spokesman for a generation. And I, was, I followed the jam and I was around the jam and I ended up working with, with Paul Weller through the last two years of the jam. And I know that that had pretty much everything to do with it. That's why the Style Council was so silly in so many places. But Morrissey, so, so I, met, sorry, I make the point in, in the book quickly. You know, at the start of 1983 in Britain, U2, Echo Nabani Orange Juice, Big Country, and, and, and then a month or so later, New Order all have top 10 hits. And, 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 and so there was a resurgence of rock music, so everything's cool. It's not like 1983 is all soft sell, Frankie, well, Culture Club, 
and Kajagoogoo. I mean, there was great music making the British charts, but none of those bands had somebody up front who really could be the, the English working class spokesman. I mean, Bono craved it, but he craved it on a global scale, and the English working class generally gave him short shrift on that. Morrissey stepped right in there and basically wanted it. And, as, and when, when he became the press darling, it was evident that he wanted it. He was willing to step up and take on that role. Um, and so that's why I think those comparisons are, are highly valid, because I think that these are bands that speak to a generation. And the Jam and the Clash ran concurrently, and they both sort of spoke to a generation, although it would probably be fair to say the Clash spoke more to Americans and the Jam spoke more to, to British people. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you almost <laughs> there was definitely a, a, a relationship between a friendship between them for sure um did and then and i i think it just didn't come off artistically and that would have been that would have been all all that it was michael stipe uh loves the creative interaction with other people and he particularly see, like, likes the company of other sort of front men um, and maybe because they've gone, gone through shared experiences but it didn't really nothing really came of it and that's about as much as I can answer on that I wish I could give you more sorry okay. was, that, was that really written about Michael's time? was that what sorry? Found, found, found that. so I'm sorry can you speak up a bit that, that song that it, during the solo career found 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 which it, it, it had that line finally someone in this um Somebody worth it, and it was rumored it was about Michael Stipe. Again, I wouldn't know, but there are there are lots of rumors about lots and lots of lyrics out there, and it gets back to. I'm going to flip this back around. I mean, the last the, the last song on the last Smiths album is called "I Won't Share You," which pretty much everybody took as Morrissey about Ma, basically saying, "I'm not going to share you with Brian Ferry." Uh, <laughs> and the very final song that they did along with work is a four letter word um was called um i keep mine hidden and being bands bands never actually get around to asking each other what the song means and i know enough about rem to know that the rem have never just never asked michael stipe what the lyric means <laughs> so to to until probably till his dying day johnny Marr will never know if either or both of those songs were written about him or not written about him because he's never going to ask and it's very, very interesting you have that dynamic that you're that close to somebody but you can't bring yourself to ask well was that about me so i think i think often morrissey has been keen to say uh because a lot of the first album was about him but <clears throat> all lyricists ensure that it's not just about them and there did come a point two or three albums in the morris had to say look these songs are not me i'm the singer i'm the narrator they're not autobiographical. Don't think that every word I'm singing is, is, my, um, is my take on life. I think that's important to know. It's, it's funny that the fans fantasy, that uh, hand in glove especially, that for, mm -hmm. for a, a sizable percentage of Smith's fans, that's our fantasy of like, you know, Morrissey, you know, and Marr, and you know, how much this friendship means to him. And uh, I, I, it, it's, it's so easy to project that onto yes. these songs. I think in that case, I, I really think it is. And yet, maybe you get the benefit of hearing that, knowing that it was about that friendship. But when the band came out, it sounded like a love song. So, I mean, if you had just fallen, <clears throat> fallen in love with the girl or the boy of your dreams, that song could just be about, about you. It's only years later that you, you, you look at the, the, the storyline of the Smiths and you say, oh, so maybe this was a song about, about Morrissey's exuberance for this friendship and that somebody had found him and placed trust, faith in him and trust in him and that, uh, so stay on my arm, you little charmer. And I, I think that song is less, is less dubious. I think early on Morrissey was probably much more clear about who he was writing, who he was. I think the first person was more evidently Morrissey in, in 1983, 84 than in the later years, yeah. yeah. You mentioned Depeche Mode a little bit earlier, and I'm curious if there was any sort of regard between either of those bands, and if there was any sort of relationship there as well. That is, that is a good one, because Morrissey had a journalism job 
on the British music press in 1980-81. It was kind of bottom of the barrel. He was uh, reviewing live gigs in Manchester for Record Mirror, which was the smallest of the four papers. And the, the live review is really the way, I mean, that's, that's the, um, the mailroom job that you work your way up from. And the very last review he wrote was actually of Depeche Mode, and he really slagged them off. Um, really? Yeah, well, if you want, if you want, we can find this, because I'm sure the index is, is, is functioning. And it's interesting because it's not too much later that um, he's going to find himself sharing a lot of fans with Depeche Mode in America. <laughs> and, and this is one of these interesting things about, um, about the difference between Britain and America, because, um, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, I was, I was referenced Duran Duran in the section I was, I was reading from. You've got that, that, that book, which, which I just bought my copy tonight, and I've read your first book and haven't read this. But Duran Duran have a totally different perception in Britain than they do in America. And that's one of the most curious. And Depeche Mode, likewise, but Depeche Mode were on an independent label, and it looked like they were running their own business affairs. And about two or three albums in, they toughened up. And, and so they, they worked and gained their respect. But in Britain, they were seen as a bubblegum band. Um, yeah, here's what he wrote. So, um, the, the, so the, the second of those occasions, uh, a gig at which Ludus opened for Depeche Mode turned out to be his final paid review. Um, and he's writing about Ludus because the singer from Ludus is this woman, Linda, Linda Sterling, who's really his muse. Um, an incredibly talented woman who was an incredibly big influence. And talking about rumoured rumored relationships, there's been a lot of rumours about relationship between the two of them. Uh, but so he writes a lot about Ludus in, in this because he's basically doing his friends a favour. Of course, as a pop magazine, Record Mirror was none so interested in Ludus as Depeche Mode. And Morrissey, not yet knowing that in a little over a year he would be leading a musical charge against the headlining band's former synth pop, and that a couple of years after that they would share thousands of the same fans in America, <laughs> man the barricades for the time being from the critics' perspective. They resurrect every murderously monotonous cliché ever known to man, he wrote, <laughs> assailing their top 20 hit single, New Life, as nothing more than a bland jelly baby. <laughs> so, but he also, in another review for Recomir, he he's, he's said it was time for Iggy Pop to, to, to hang up and retire, and I, I guess Iggy didn't read that review. So. <laughs> <laughs> fact, I must have read the line about Depeche Mode, and my brain just erased it because I didn't want it to be true. That's... <laughs> Because, like you said, like especially in the '90s, like it seemed like uh, that they had a lot of the same fans in America. Definitely, <coughs> definitely. Well, well, Morrissey would have shared a lot of fans with with Depeche Mode. I can see it more with Depeche Mode. It's an amazing thing, and it's it's really uh, a conversation that, that that Rob should take over. You know, doing his own book event because some of these bands just have a very different appeal in America than than, than back in Britain, and. That is, and that really relates to the question about the cult of Morrissey being stronger in America. There are, there are these curiosities. And I, because I've lived here since 87, 88, and because I spent uh, actually a, a large amount of time for the next five years on sort of alternative dance floors, I, I get some of this. I, I understand it. Uh, and I can understand why for a 16 or year old uh, American in 1981, Duran Duran would have sounded exotic and avant-garde. Um, and Depeche Mode likewise, whereas in Britain they were both seen as, as, as bubblegum bands. Wow. Yeah. Wow. A couple more, a couple more, and then we'll probably wind up. You said like, that no one has really replaced Morrissey as, like, as, as Morrissey. Um, and I was just thinking, like, as a theory, it's of course arguable, and maybe Rob could back me up on this, but like, maybe Sue Malkness. As sort of like not obviously the like sexual way. I don't think anyone idolizes him the same way, that way as Morrissey. But like I feel like Pavement hits a lot of the same emotional spots for me. You know, not all the time, not like Serpentine had, but like a lot of the same feelings that I get listening to them as I do with the Smiths. I can see that, but the point would be that if you went out on the street and said, "Have you heard of Stephen Malkmus?" Well, we're right. We're in Brooklyn, so go somewhere. Go somewhere else in America. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Have you heard of Stephen Marcus? <laughs> and they probably say who. Uh, and there is a chance people have heard of Morrissey. It's, it's interesting where I live, uh, and I, I now live up in around Woodstock, and it, it's somewhat like you would imagine. But there's a lot of people, sort of my age, that have moved up there in recent years, and there is a cutoff point. But so people my age and younger know the Smiths, and people sort of much older 
really don't. But some of the older people, if you mention the name Morrissey, they do know it. So I have this reference point. So I tell people, yeah, I've got this big new book out on the Smiths. And they're like, never heard of them. And I say, Morrissey? And they say, oh, yeah, I know that guy, Morrissey. Yeah, okay, yeah. So that would be the, that would be the thing. I think we've probably all got somebody personally who speaks to us as, as powerfully, but I don't think on a level that that they're still filling rooms like this. This the the, the, the size of rooms that Morrissey's filling this many years later. Yeah, I think that, and that's really one more. more. Yeah, more of a question of where music's going, how people consume music. Are there even going to be big stars like that that everybody walking down the street is going to know their names? But I, I've always wondered about. Mentioning some influences, uh, New York Dolls were a huge influence on Morrissey. He did a fan mm -hmm. about them and everything. And he talked about drugs earlier and how Morrissey always conveyed, at least in America, conveyed this somewhat teetotaler image. Mm -hmm. Did he divorce himself from all that debauchery of the Dolls and just really like the music or vice versa? And, you know what I mean? Like, did he, did he just kind of... I, th I think for him, uh, I'm... I'm not in a position to speak for him, but I guess as a biographer, I, I, I've, I've got some kind of sense. I think he got a vicarious thrill out of the New York Dolls. I think that the, that the New York Dolls were living the life that as a, let me get the age right, as a sort of 14-year-old in Manchester, looking at that first New York Dolls cover and, and really falling for the band. I think they were living the lifestyle that he would love to have been as brave as the New York Dolls. And such a difference between New York City and Manchester New York City could accommodate a band like the New York Dolls. And it was, it was cool. It was okay to dress up like that. The Dolls took it to an extreme, but it was okay. It wasn't abnormal to, to, to be a bit of a peacock in, in the very early 70s. To do that in, in Manchester was absolutely an invitation to get beaten up. England is a very, very, very violent country. It still is. Still really is. And um, Morrissey could get beaten up uh, just for carrying you know, some kind of a denim bag. And the point has been made about Bowie, and Bowie was incredibly influential, and he gave a lot of kids that, that freedom. And Bowie, I'm sorry, Morrissey did engage in some of that personal kind of freedom, and he did go to uh, Roxy and Bowie gigs, and he did find a friend from school who was a real hard case that they would kind of try dyeing their hair and go into some of these shows. But, but I think some of that was the vicarious thrill. And as for, the, um, as for the drugs aspect, I just think that Morrissey probably just got off on the, uh, on, on, on the music and the idea of what the band represented rather than the fact that they you know, did too much too soon to, to quote their second album. Yeah. Does anybody take one more? one more? Anybody not ask one that wants to ask one? If not... We'll... You mentioned Stephen Street. Yes. What was his response? To, to to the book, you said he came to... Uh, to... Oh yeah, he took part in this event. He was, um, he was very, very, very happy with it. I've actually gotten a lot of really, really positive feedback from people who, who were interviewed for the book that, um, that I got it right. And that means an awful lot to me. And in fact, some of the much lesser names, people who were in Manchester, um, both the Smith's first bass player and the drummer who turned down drumming in the Smiths because he didn't like the cut of Morrissey's jib <laughs> <laughs> and didn't like the long overcoat brigade and he went on to drum with the fall for 14 years so it just you know he he realized I guess it's this turned that one down those I mean those are two people that that, that wrote to me and said yeah I, I actually it was like you you've been in the room with us during that period yeah. uh, and I and that's about as high an honor as you can get Stephen Street was absolutely fine he says that apparently Jeff Travis took credit in the book for introducing Morrissey to Vinnie Riley and Stephen insists it was him and I know that Jeff Travis took credit with me for that and that's part of what you deal with as a biographer is people get hazy memories and people very often want to take credit for things and that's a tough part as a biographer uh, it, usually everybody, everybody will take credit for everything and you kind of have to pass your way through that and figure out what the truth is with it. Well, thank you for getting it right, thank you. Thank you. And thanks, thanks to Rob for coming along and doing this. This, I think, is great as well. So thank you. Thank you.